this whole discussion is really about people that didn't get a say in their stuff being used. But at the same time, it also impacts and ultimately powers the tools that are being used by all these other people. Hi, I'm CK. And I'm Michelle. And we are developers here at Crema. Today we're going to talk about uh, some ethical considerations involved with generative AI, uh, specifically related to sourcing training data. So in case you haven't heard, seen, or played with generative AI tools, they are a big deal right now. They're being used to create new fields. Uh, they are disrupting lots of fields, but the technologies themselves aren't new, and neither are the upsides or pitfalls of playing with fancy new toys. But there's really three main contenders in this space that we wanted to quickly identify. Those are OpenAI, Stable Diffusion, and MidJourney. They're fun, they're powerful, you know, they're transforming things in the way that we all work, but they're also rocking a lot of boats, especially in the art field, and that's where we're gonna kind of focus our attention today with the ethics conversation. Crema is made up of a lot of curious folks. We like to play, we like to have fun, we like to investigate new tools as they come out, mm -hmm. and so we had an opportunity to do so with our holiday party last year. Several of us worked together to create an sort of a Mad Libs meets machine learning meets art installation. We took some of the generative tools that were available and made it so that you could just do a quick uh, selection of different keywords that you wanted. It would combine into a prompt that would then generate art and we would project it onto a canvas. All of that is really just one implementation of these tools and it was a fun way to get into it. But then we started peeling back the layers a little bit to understand more about how these tools actually work and some of the things that go into creating them. But before we go down that path, it might be helpful just to kind of define our terms a little bit and say what we mean by generative AI, specifically within the research field of machine learning. So we wanna take a step back and ask, you know, what is machine learning? Um, and one of the questions I receive the most is, how are AI and machine learning related? Artificial intelligence is really just a bucket umbrella term that encompasses a lot of different uh, fields within it. One of those is machine learning, which also then encompasses the smaller subset of research um, called deep learning. Deep learning is really just a set of neural networks um, with many hidden layers and interconnected nodes. Um, and most of the, our research um, recent advancements and research has been in this space. Deep vision, when we're talking about convolutional neural networks and um, these generative AI, um, it sort of sits within that and then the intersection of generative adversarial networks um, or GANs. And generative AI is different from discriminatory AI in that um, in discriminatory AI, we might say, here is a sl selection of apples mm -hmm. and pears, and then I'm gonna take a photo of an apple and ask it to say, you know, what is this? Mm -hmm. And the model will report back, well, this is an apple. In generative AI, uh, we're giving it a, set, a selection of apples, and then we say, create a new apple that I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the two, the two differences there. So how do you train a computer to create or to learn or to create new permutations, which is probably a little more accurate, because what we're talking about are the processes before these algorithms take place, and that's in the training data. That all has to come from somewhere, and the ethics of that are where it's sourced, uh, what it contains, who had a say in those things. And that's ultimately why we wanted to surface this conversation around not just how these tools are amazing and transforming industries and all of that, but ultimately about the ethics of what is making these tools work and is that a sustainable way for us to continue forward as we go deeper and deeper into these fields. I think sometimes the word ethics can, can feel very like an elitist topic. You know, we're, we're not trying to say I'm not trying to say what is the the right thing necessarily, mm. but um, you know ethics are subjective sometimes. <laughs> and uh, what we want to talk about is where we feel like wh sure. where on the line do we feel like we fit into this conversation, where our beliefs sit, mm -hmm. um, and then you know making sure that we adhere to them. And so sometimes that is taking a step back and saying, okay. Now that we've gained a little bit of understanding here and how this is working, well, how do we feel about it? Hmm. And how do we feel about it going forward? Is this something that we want to contribute to? Is this something that we want to be involved with? Or is there another um, method that sort of aligns a little bit stronger with, with our personal beliefs? Yeah, and that really could take us right back to the holiday party because <laughs> the goal there was to create something fun and interactive, but we started to peel back the onion a little bit when, really it was when you found 
the uh, AI-generated avatar tool <sighs> that rose in popularity around that time. And there was a lot of questions around that. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, the AI avatars that we were seeing all over social media, that it seemed like um, you know everyone and their mother was uh, participating in. And uh, you, you see these like on your feed, they're hard to ignore because everyone's using them. Mm -hmm. and, and you want to say, well, where did this come from? You know, what is this sitting on top of? And it was sitting on top of stable diffusion, mm -hmm. which, you know, it, it led us to do a little bit of investigation of, you know, how, how is this specific model working? Um, without getting too far into the weeds, there are a lot of copyright loopholes. Mm -hmm. One of them is that if you're a nonprofit, uh, you kind of get around some of the um, the public domain requirements, mm -hmm. right? So you can, you can scrape yeah. data uh, from various places very freely. And then there's another loophole that Stable Diffusion is using in that instead of storing images in their model, they're actually storing links to those images. Right. So as we continued to research Stable Diffusion specifically, we found more and more of these questionable practices that just didn't sit right. We weren't comfortable with it at that point. And it turns out that there actually are now uh, several open lawsuits, including one by Getty Images, specifically mm -hmm. against Stable Diffusion. And these kinds of things are going to continue to surface. Uh, other companies and their models that they've developed are probably also going to come under fire. So it's not that you can necessarily avoid a litigation, but we do have to start asking the question, okay, what are the ethics of the way that this training data is obtained and how is it combined into a data set that is then used to train a model that is used to create things that some people are profiting off of. There are companies who are using Stable Diffusion as a profit center because they have taken the model that they created and turned it into a business. So that means that that business is now being driven by artwork and other information, medical information, and other things that were not obtained in a uh, proper way of considering the person who owned that information in the first place. Ethical considerations and the conversations around them are always relevant. It doesn't matter where we are in history, we're gonna have to keep having these conversations and we're gonna have to push into these ambiguities and some of these uncomfortable things in order to make sure that we're building on a foundation that makes sense for the future. So you might be asking as we've gone through all of this, why does any of this matter? One of the very interesting things about um, the field of AI and machine learning right now is that it requires us to be more than computer scientists. It requires us to have at least one foot um, on the side of ethics. You know, in the case of generative AI tools, um, there are a lot of different ethical conversations going on right now. Um, some of them being, you know, is AI, AI art art? Mm. Is, um, you know, should I be able to include certain artists' names that are not in the public domain as prompts? Mm. Um, and, and those are all very relevant and, and very long conversations. But specifically, what we're talking about here today is sourcing training data. Mm -hmm. Training data is the foundation of any machine learning model and its life cycle. If we don't get it right in the very beginning, we're going to perpetuate this throughout mm. the span. In our case here, what we're talking about, the training data is artwork. Whether or not you're an artist, whether or not you even care about art, art is still the work of someone. Mm -hmm. If they cannot consent to having their work included as something that builds a model, then we're, we're going to fail in other industries as well. Um, because history has shown many movements start in the art world. And if we don't create the right sort of agreements here, if we cannot come to a consensus, then we're going to perpetuate this across multiple industries. So whether or not you care about if an artist's work, you know, belongs to them, you know, you might care once it gets to your industry. Mm. Whether you're a computer scientist and, you know, you've produced some code that's maybe publicly on GitHub, whether you're you know, a doctor, mm. and some of your findings are, are sitting somewhere on the internet. Should anyone have a right to that mm. just because it's on the internet? This whole discussion is really about the people that didn't get a say in their stuff being used. But at the same time, it also impacts and ultimately powers the tools that are being used by all these other people. So it's like, we want to explain what this is doing, but it's even more important that we talk about the people who didn't get a say in how these things are working. Mm -hmm. Because that's the question that is easy to gloss over when we see something shiny and we want to just play with it a whole bunch. Just to show that this is actually already happening, uh, in, depending on the country where you live, we have GDPR over in Europe 
that for years now has been a standard of what it means to have privacy and individual rights and how that is put into systems that they build uh, for profit or for government use, etc. In the United States in 2022, there were at least 17 states that either uh, introduced or resolved to have bills and resolutions around artificial intelligence and the way that it's being used. So this is a current conversation. It's something that is going to impact all the different industries that are currently dabbling in this. And that's one reason why we have to start asking these hard questions before we build something off of a foundation that is a little bit off axis. Yeah, and it can be uh, sometimes tricky to uh, find a valid business use case, you know, in ethics. And if the ethics can't convince, um, you know, a stakeholder that, that it's an important piece of the process, there is risk, mm. right? If there's one thing that enterprises don't like, it's surprise. <laughs> And uh, regulation, I would say, is a pretty big surprise. It is. Um, yeah, there, there's quite a bit of like anonymity in scraping data, but when your system is built on on that, like eventually it will come to light, and and there is a reputation that's at stake. Going back to to regulation, there there's a cost um, if a product comes under uh, legal scrutiny, and maybe they have to redo their training data. Mm. That's, I think, a possibility um, at what we're looking at right now. There's various other outcomes. And if I'm a business that is built on top of this product that's facing regulation, I'm gonna have to pivot. And there's a cost to that. There's a risk factor involved in not anticipating these sorts of things. Mm. How do we do that in a sustainable and responsible way? Like, how do we maintain a sense of curiosity, but also be responsible? I think you just said it, CK, um, you, you maintain a sense of curiosity, right? It was curiosity that led us to want to play with these tools, and it was curiosity to ask how they were built. Hmm. And if we remain curious, we're going to uncover things. Um, and then part of that, too, is, is within that process, there needs to be a point where we step back and we evaluate what we've uncovered, and we say, is this something that we align with? Hmm. Yeah, I think the, the consent, the data privacy, opt-in as a default, you know, as, a, as an agreement between organizations and users, um, we know we can't avoid the misuse of these things because we will always accidentally stumble too far. But I think, yeah, coming back to that idea of always being willing to ask questions and be curious about where we are and where we've landed has to be a way of life for us, especially in the technology sphere. We're really only scratching the surface here mm -hmm. on one small ethical aspect in a very vast conversation, right? Um, we're only looking at art. Mm -hmm. This also impacts music, um, you know, and, and many other different industries. We acknowledge that there is a lot more to say here, mm -hmm. um, and, and we're only representing our opinion, mm -hmm. okay? This is not fact, this is our opinion. And um, there's gonna be a lot of diverse perspectives of um, in this category and in the related ones as well. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, there's a lot of questions here and there's a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, the only way that we're ever gonna come to a societal consensus on these types of things is if we bring a diverse perspective to the table and have these sorts of conversations. Um, so that was kind of our goal today was just to um, publicly surface some of our internal thoughts mm -hmm. as we play with these products and ask you all, um, you know, what are the questions that you might have? What are your opinions on this? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with us? Do you disagree with us? Um, is there more that you'd like us to cover in depth? So because we are Crema, the ethics side is always going to come through in this conversation, but this is just one aspect of it. And so artificial intelligence, machine learning, these are topics we're going to continue to explore here on the YouTube channel, but also in the People of Product podcast. We encourage you to join the conversation and thanks for listening to us talk through these sticky subjects as we all try to get better uh, as people and as product people. Thank you for uh, joining this conversation with us and for watching.